introduce Chris Warner today as part of the Leading at Google series. Uh, Chris is one of America's top climbers and has summited over 100 times on peaks over 19,000 feet uh, and five times on 8,000 meter peaks. He has guided throughout the US, the Alps, Africa, the Andes of Peru, Ecuador, Argentina, and the Himalayas of Nepal, as well as Tibet, including Mount Everest. His writings on leadership have appeared in Smart CEO Magazine, Upward Bound, and his latest book, High Altitude Leadership, which he'll be discussing today. Chris is not just a climbing bum, in a contrary to <laughs> what the beard and mustache might say, but he is also the owner of Earth Trex Climbing Centers, a company with over 175 employees in three different locations. Based on Chris's combination of climbing skills and entrepreneurial experience, the EarthTrex team was chosen in 2000 to guide leadership development expeditions uh, for the Wharton School of Business. Um, and I just graduated from the Wharton School, which is where I first met Chris this past March. Uh, I was on his team for our attempt to climb Mount Cotopaxi. So I was really fortunate to be able to work with Chris firsthand and learned a lot from him, uh, specifically as he was yelling at me to get my butt up the mountain um, <laughs> on a very cold uh, you know, Saturday morning at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, but I learned a lot from Chris, and I'm really excited that he's here today uh, to be able to share his experience on K2 and his thoughts on leadership uh, with you guys. So welcome. Well, thanks, Archana. And <clears throat> Thanks to everybody at Google for inviting me out here. It's, uh, it's an honor. When I was talking to Alana about the Google culture, it, it kept thinking that this is just like Mountaineers. You know, you uh, wake up in the middle of the night with some harebrained idea, you know, that only you should be excited about. And then you go back to work and you start to share this idea with a couple of other people. They get excited and uh, before you know it, you've launched an expedition. And uh, we've all been on these crazy adventures. And, just like launching a product at Google or launching an expedition, it's not really until you start to take two or three or 10 or 100 steps down the way that you realize you have to iterate. You have to you know, adjust your plan to try to reach your ultimate goal. And uh, if you're successful, you get to the summit. But we all know that we don't get to the summit every single time. I've led uh, 145 international mountaineering expeditions. I've been on Everest as one example three different times, guiding the North Ridge. And you know, sometimes we get to the top and sometimes we don't. And one thing that I've learned along the way is that um, you know, generally the most dangerous thing that we face on these peaks are the people that we're climbing with. And in mountaineering, you know, they look at all the reasons why people die, and it's not till the fifth reason that we find out that it was Mother Nature. Prior to that, the top four reasons that people die is because of human error. So if we could kind of figure out a way to engineer some of these errors out of there, then we might be able to get to the top on a more regular basis. I, the first, uh, well, as I said, I, had, I have climbed Mount Everest. I got to the summit in 2001. Uh, when I got to the top, I had expected, you know, as a mountaineer, maybe a little bit, um, you know, kind of naive or, uh, you know, uh, at least ex expectant that I would get to the top and that, you know, some angels would sing and I would suddenly have some kind of information that would make me special. And when I got to the summit of Everest, it was the record summit day on that peak. 89 people reached the top that day. So instead of angels, I heard people, you know, clicking cameras and, you know, holding up banners and, you know, shouting out all this kind of heroic stuff. And uh, it, really, it really kind of bummed me out. I said, you know, why did it, you know, if Everest is the greatest peak in mountaineering, then how come it doesn't feel like that to me? And as I came down off that mountain, I started to think, well, there's got to be some place out there where I will hear the angels sing, where I'll be able to get to the top and I'll really learn a tremendous amount about myself and about, you know, my, uh, teaming and about my role in mountaineering. And I started to think that I needed a challenge that was a lot greater than Everest. And for most mountaineers, the bigger challenge is K2. So K2 is the second highest peak in the world. Does anyone here ever climb K2? I, I doubted it. <laughs> the, uh, on, has anyone here ever climbed Everest? So you know that there's been 4,000 people st have stood on the summit of Mount Everest. That's a, quite a bit. In fact, in 2001, the year I summited, somebody on that summit day was the 2,000th person to get to the top. In, the, in May of 2007, 540 people stood on the summit of Mount Everest. In one month, 540 people. On K2, in the history of K2, up through 2007, only 253 people reached the summit of the mountain. So it's dramatically different. But you know, in climbing, we have a statistic, I think, that kind of points out the difference even greater. We have uh, the death to summit ratio. And uh, on Everest, there's been 208 deaths and roughly uh, 4,000 summits. So the ratio is 1.8% death to summits. 
You guys have that in baseball or soccer? <laughs> in, on K2, up through 2007, the death to summit ratio was 23.8%, right? So dramatically different peak than, than Mount Everest. In fact, of the people who reached the top of, Mount, of K2, uh, one in seven of the summiters will actually die on the way back down. So it is a, a horribly difficult peak. It's extremely dangerous. And uh, you would think that if you're going to go climb there, that the best way to get yourself to the top and more importantly to come back down was to team up with the best of the best, right? So if you're with the A team, you know, the all-stars, this is going to be the way to get to the summit. And that's what I thought. So when I was given a phone call by this guy, Henry Todd, in 2002, and he said, hey, Chris, I'm putting together an expedition with 12 of the best mountaineers in the world. Will you join us? I jumped at the chance. I thought, you know, here it was, if I was ever going to have a team that was going to, you know, make me better, it was going to be this team. It was the worst team I've ever been on. In fact, we couldn't have organized a picnic, never mind a summit attempt. And uh, Henry Todd, who is our leader, he's a great guy. He's actually very colorful. And he was quite entrepreneurial. Back in the 60s, he was the largest distributor of LSD in Europe, right? So... <laughs> We wouldn't have things like Pink Floyd without this guy. So anyway, Henry, uh, Henry did spend seven years in jail. And uh, when he got out of jail, he decided, I never want to sleep indoors again. So he moved to Nepal, and he started running these expeditions. So as I said, he put together 12 people to go climb K2. I was honored to be on that team. We didn't get anywhere that year. In fact, nobody summited K2 in 2002. The weather really was that bad. The expedition ended for me on my birthday when I saw this man fall 5,000 feet down off the side of the mountain. Every time his body hit the slopes, he literally exploded red. And uh, when you just see this big splash of scarlet on the snow, and then he would bounce out again. And he landed 500 feet away from us. Everybody was so gripped that only two of us would leave from where we were, climb out to where his body was. When we got to him, his legs were wrapped underneath him in a way that he shouldn't have been. The whole back of his skull was completely collapsed. His eyes were in the wrong place, his nose, the whole thing. And two of us had to wrap him up. We had to hide his body in such a way that nobody would see it. Because to tell you the truth, it was so shocking, the sight of him. And when we reached underneath his, his torso to lift him up, I became completely drenched in his blood. We were able to wrap him inside one tent, and he still bled through the tent. We wrapped him in another tent. He bled through that. We finally got a gigantic plastic garbage bag, wrapped it around him, and that was the only thing that kept the blood from seeping back out. And then we lowered him down to where everybody else was waiting. And we got down there. I felt like I could hand his body off, and the second I did that, the stress hit me. I felt like I was being stabbed with 37 or 100 knives in my gut, and I literally bent over, you know, bent over and started sobbing, crying. And it, you know, it's, it's my birthday, and I want to go home. And so I packed up all my stuff, and I headed back to the United States. When you die on K2, uh, they take the plate that you have been eating off of for the last two months, and uh, they, of course, scrape the food off it. And then they take a, a hammer and a nail, and they'll etch your name into these plates. So this is the plate from Captain Iqbal, who we saw fall 5,000 feet to his death. There's 63 plates that are strapped to this, uh, this pile of rocks called the Gilkey Memorial to memorialize the 63 people who had died up to the point when this picture was taken. Right? So this mountain is extremely deadly. Uh, it's very rare that we're able to get to your body to take it back down. In 2003, of all the teams who went to K2, nobody summited. In 2004, there was a bunch of teams that went to K2. Some teams summited, two people died. 2005, I returned to K2. This time I was gonna do it completely different. Instead of going with the best of the best team, I was gonna go with just uh, one trusted friend. We reached 25,000 feet on two different occasions. Both times we were stopped by gigantic uh, snowstorms. Eventually we had to walk off the mountain completely exhausted. I had lost over 35 pounds. The day that this picture was taken, I started to pee blood. It's a long walk as you walk out. It takes about four or five days to get back to the trailhead. So just days of just somber marching. And, you know, you're kind of feeling sorry for yourself because you failed. You know, you're peeing blood. You know, you're just like, you think you've given it all. And every step I took, I kept telling myself, I'm going to come back someday, right? So the first time I went with a team of 12 of the best, right, we didn't get to the summit. In fact, of those 12 people, six of them have since died. So it's been a, a rough uh, run for that gang. I went back in 2005, we didn't summit. In fact, in 2005, nobody summited. In 2006, uh, four people got to the top, six people died, right? So it's a 
been a horrible couple of years. I decided in 2007 I was going to go back again, and I, this time I wanted to put together, put even more emphasis on who I was going to climb with. You know, in the first time we hired everybody on our team based on resumes, and it didn't work out at all. Right? The second time I had the guy who had, you know who I knew on a behavioral level was going to be the perfect partner, but we never got the shot because of the weather. And then this year, I wanted to do the same thing, hire people based upon proven track record of behavior, not based on their resumes. So I got a hold of a guy named Don Bowie, who actually lives in California in Bishop. And uh, Don had never summited an 8,000-meter peak, but he is a mountain rescue guy, and uh, he is, has an impeccable reputation in the, in the sport. And then we got a hold of a guy named Bruce Normand, who's also had never summoned an 8,000 meter peak, but uh, he is uh, very famous for doing this exploratory mountaineering, and I've known him for about a dozen years. So it seemed like we had a really good team. It seemed like, if nothing else, that we could come together and agree on a couple of goals. And our first goal was everybody had to get home alive, right? Our second goal was that we all wanted to summit, and our third goal is we wanted to do it in a style that represented who we were as people, that really showed off the best of what we believe mountaineering to be. So we went off to the mountain. We got there on June 1st at K2, as being K2, sending down these gigantic avalanches. We placed base camp uh, on this glacier here at 17,200 feet. From there, we have to march up the glacier through the ice falls to access this side of K2. On the second day of the expedition, we almost die the first time. Bruce and I are tied together by a rope. We're passing through this gigantic ice fall. And as he's walking across a snow bridge, he's walking across what seems like a completely flat section of snow. Suddenly, the floor gives out on him. And he goes shooting 25 feet down into this hole, this gigantic crevasse. Now, crevasse could be 250 feet to 500 feet deep. And he's rocketing down in there. He's tied by, to me by a rope. Suddenly, that rope comes tight. And I'm in a tug of war. I know I'm going to lose. And I'm being dragged towards the lip of this crevasse. The two of us are going to be, you know, rocket down to the bottom. We'll just be entombed in ice. Within an hour or two, we will die, and they will never be able to find our bodies. And as I'm sliding across, knowing I'm going to die, suddenly the ground underneath me explodes open, and I fall in a separate crevasse. And Bruce is 25 feet down in one hole, and I'm five feet down in the other, right? So it was a pure miracle, right? It was just... It, I'm still blown away by that. In fact, looking at the history of mountaineering, never before have two people fallen into two different crevasses at exactly the same time, right? Normally, you both fall in the same crevasse, and as I said, they just put a little, take your dinner plate and type, type your name into it and hang it on the rock. Well, we started up the mountain, and we made actually four different attempts through June and into July, and each time we would be stopped by the horrendous snowstorms that are typical in this part of the world. Uh, we would climb in the snowstorms quite often because we knew we had to force our way up. We had to get 500 pounds of equipment into place, you know, tents and sleeping bags and stoves and ropes and all sorts of other stuff. We had established the camps. We had all this work to do, just pure labor when you're on a mountaineering expedition. You know, you, somebody comes up with a great idea. It sounds like a lot of fun at home, and then you get there, and you find that it's nothing but brutally difficult work. We would push no matter what the weather was, so we would be out in, you know, a blizzard, wind blowing 40 miles an hour, temperatures of minus 20, uh, sometimes we would stay up there as long as we could past the point when we would run out of food. I don't know if you guys have ever had a stale bread and goose sandwich before, you know, but it's not the most, uh, you know, culinary uh, thing. You can see the look on their faces, how desperate this meal is going to be. Uh, we pushed our way up to Camp 3. We got all the way up to 24,500 feet. And at this point, things really slowed down for us. The snow was deeper than waist deep. And we tried. We tried really hard to push our way up. We never could figure out a way. We couldn't make it. We physically couldn't, didn't have enough uh, labor or enough push to be able to break the trail through this deepest snow. We would go out. We would maybe make 100 or 200 feet of progress in a day, and that was it. And finally, we decided it was physically impossible for a team of three to be able to pull this off. So we came all the way back down to base camp. Now, we were not the only team that was working on the mountain at the same time. There was a strong Russian team. There was a strong Korean team. There was a, a team of Italians who arrived late who were not as strong. There was an Iranian climber, and there was two Portuguese climbers. They were also trying the same thing. But for some reason, none of us were on the same sequence, the same schedule, right? mainly because most people wanted somebody else to do the hard work. So everyone always tried to stay one camp below, right? So, well, the Russians got to Camp 3, and they also failed to make it higher. 
The Koreans got to Camp 3, they also failed to make it higher. We got to Camp 3, we failed to make it higher. And once everyone had experienced that failure, we knew we could then have a conversation about cooperation. So we've got everyone together back in base camp. It's now the middle of July. We know we only have maybe one, at most two more attempts left in us before the season is going to close. And if we don't come together now to make a, a, a you know, concerted summit bid, we don't stand a chance. So we have uh, all the team leaders come together, and we create a plan. And the plan is, uh, you know, it's got, a, it's got a high level of detail to it, but it's pretty basically simple. We'll all go together, right? And we will all leave based on weather forecasts that our team is getting because they seem very reliable. And the plan is that we are going to leave on the morning of the 15th of July. For us, it's our fifth attempt on the mountain. We have now been away from home for uh, about 60 days. So we've been out for a long period of time. And uh, here we are heading up the mountain. We were leaving base camp about 5.30 in the morning, or 6.30 in the morning. Step on the beast. Here we go, is the first step. Pretty nice up there, huh? Yeah. Well, here we are, back on our way up K2. We're below Camp 1. And sure enough, it's snowing and blowing on us again. This mountain loves to torture us. Certainly never given us the easy way out. Beautiful camp one again. God. We got up this morning and we looked up onto the Black Pyramid towards Camp 2. There was just a number of clouds ripping across the face. We were alone, there was no one else with us. And so we kind of talked to each other and we all decided, let's just go for it. This is the funnel right here. This is probably the worst place to be in conditions like this. We can only go through this section one at a time. It's just too dangerous. Here we are at 23,000 feet and uh, the weather's just not cooperating at all. Don is doing a great job of breaking trail for us. Days like this really fill you with doubt. Snow conditions are just horrendous. And uh, look like the wind died about an hour and a half ago. It's one of those days when you, you wish you took up golf instead of mountaineering. I right, will just find Camp 3 somehow. And then probably four hours before we're ready to roll in our sleeping bags over. Without exaggeration, you couldn't touch bottom. 
And uh, but we did get here. We we're all comfortable. We're boiling water, and we'll head for Camp Four tomorrow. The only problem with getting to Camp Three was that nobody else came with us. Right? So that was the plan. All the teams would come together and we'd all make this gigantic rush. Well, they all rolled over that first morning when they saw there was snow and they went back to bed. So here we are at Camp 3. We have waist deep snow ahead of us. We are desperate to get to the summit. We have no choice but to make a push by ourselves. So the next morning we get up and it is a crystal clear, beautiful day. And we start to move up through this deep snow. And it took us a while to break, to break trail. In fact, we were going so slow that people who were a day behind us were eventually able to catch up to us, right? So they climbed all the way up to Camp 2, up to Camp 3, and then some people moved from Camp 3 up towards us. And uh, they couldn't believe how slow the progress was until they got in front of us. So here comes the Portuguese. They're like, come on, you guys can go faster. And we're like, why don't you give us some help? And they're like, great. So they rushed ahead, and they took 10 steps, and they said, this is impossible. We should camp here. And they were right. So we put up a camp four or 500 feet above where everybody else was camping at Camp 3. We call it Camp 3 and a half. So here we are at Camp 3 and a half, and we're getting ready to push on to Camp 4. And if you could crank the sound up, because the louder the better, I think. Here we are at 7,700 meters, inside of our Camp 3.5. Well, it's quite an amazing place underneath this giant tower of ice. There's the team getting ready to leave camp. Not very much. Welcome to Camp 4. Okay, the shoulder? Yep. Nice. It's too bad the view's not very good. Yeah. Jeez. How do you feel, Bruce? Tired, happy, and ecstatic at the view. You just can't stay on top of the water because of that thing. Well, that thing that Bruce is talking about is the, the final 2,500 feet of the climb. So when we leave here, and our plan is to leave here between 10.30 and 11.30 at night, We'll walk across this section called the shoulder. This is all above 26, it's about 26 and a half to almost 27,000 feet. Then we climb into this section here called the bottleneck, and that is um, a really steep gully, maybe uh, up to 55 degrees steep. And then at the top of that, we traverse under this hanging glacier. This glacier here is over 500 feet thick, and uh, it's dangerous in two ways. One is pieces of it are constantly coming down, and the second thing is that it becomes almost vertical as you climb across here, so it's very difficult climbing. And then we'll go around the corner, and then we'll be able to scurry from there to the summit. We think it's going to take us at least 12 hours to get to the top. In fact, your average summit day on K2 is 22 hours long. You would love to be able to summit you know, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the morning, so you have all day to be able to come back down. It tends to be on mountaineering that most of the accidents happen on the descent. So what we'd love to be able to do is to descend in, in daylight, descend in the warmth of the sun, especially because our team is not using oxygen, right? So without that extra oxygen, it really saps away more than anything else. It makes you colder. And uh, we, want, we want all every advantage to get back down alive. In fact, we don't even want to stay at Camp 4 that night if we can. We would love to descend all the way to Camp 3 because there's very little protection from storms at Camp 4. So the, that's the plan when we get there. Now, we, uh, you know, we had hoped that everybody would, would join us. Eventually, they did. We were carrying the 3,000 feet of ropes, the ice screws, the pitons, all the other stuff they needed to fix the ropes for Summit Day. And so when we got everybody into Camp 4, we went around and we gave different pieces of equipment to the stronger teams. And the way you do it on a mountain like this is that you, you don't want everybody to leave at the same time. It would cause a bottleneck. So the most efficient system is to have a small group go out first. It, they're going to go about 20% slower than the people behind them. So they go out first, they 
break the trail, they tie the knots, and then an hour later the second team goes. By the time the first, they would eventually catch up to the first team and they would then take over the responsibility of fixing the ropes, breaking the trail. Then the third team would leave an hour after the, the, that. So it would be the same system. Our plan was that we would take the, the third leg of this four leg journey. We thought it was the most dangerous leg and we really wanted to be responsible for our own safety in the most dangerous situation. We didn't want to trust our lives to other people during that situation, so that was the plan. And then the Russian team, which was an incredibly strong group of four guys, all using bottled oxygen, they would come an hour after us and then take, it, take everybody else up to the summit. So we had a Korean women's team, which is one Korean women and two Nepali Sherpas all using oxygen. They were going to leave at 1030 and take 600 feet of ropes. The Korean men's team, which was three strong Korean men on oxygen and three Nepali Sherpas on oxygen. So six of them were going to be the second team. Our team of three would be the third and then the Russians. We were the only team of those four that were not using bottled oxygen. There was then the Italians, the Portuguese, and the Iranian. We said, stay in bed. <laughs> Get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Follow behind us. Don't get, don't come up too quick because we don't want you to be creating chaos for everybody else. And so that's the plan when we go to bed. When you crawl into bed at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, you spend hours melting snow into water. You're trying to get some kind of rest. You would love to eat, but at that altitude, it's almost impossible to digest food. So you might consume 200 calories if you're lucky. And summit day generally ends up consuming about 20,000 calories of food. So you know you're going to be completely dehydrated and undernourished for the event that's ahead of you. So here we are uh, at 11, or excuse me, 1.30 in the morning. The weather conditions are excellent, and uh, we're going to start heading out. So we'll call you about two hours prior to the bottom Okay, you have a good trip. Over. Okay, we're out. I don't know if you can see anything up there. A couple of lights. They're in the bottleneck. Uh, and some Koreans, some Russians. He said that the Koreans, it seemed, were going to head out at 11 and that they were going to head out at 12, but it sounded like everybody's backed up, so they're about an hour and 20 behind where they thought they were, but uh, it sounds like they're rearing to go. So uh, the night and the summit push has begun. Pretty dramatic so far. The Korean team was ahead of us. They were all on oxygen. And one of their Sherpas fell down the south face to his death. And uh, I don't think we'll ever find his body. It's gonna be interesting to see what happens. So the day starts off with disaster. And um, we were, this picture was taken actually minutes after the Korean fell, or the Sherpa fell to his death. It's a super sad story. The guy's name was Nima Nurbu Sherpa. And he had summited Everest six different times. So he's an extremely accomplished mountaineer. He was 34 years old, so we know he was quite young. He was earning $25 a day. And he was hired to help lead the Korean team to the summit of K2. Now, for Nepali, $25 a day is a lot, but for all of us, we know that that's nothing. And, to have lost your life for $25 hardly seems uh, like a, a good deal. So what had happened was he was up near the top and um, he disconnected from the rope and he was trying to pass some other people and in the process of doing that, he may have slipped, he may have had a stroke, we don't know what exactly happened, but we do know that he started to tumble down this slope here. At one point he was going so slow it appeared as he could just stand up, but he never tried to stand up, he never tried to self-arrest with his ice axe and he just shot off his face and went shooting 9,000 feet down, just like the man that I'd watched fall 5,000 feet. I now watched the second person die on K2 fall 9,000 feet. Everybody was completely gripped. I mean, the fear was so amazing that people could barely catch their breath. Nobody knew what they were going to do at this point. Here we were watching somebody die. We knew from the history of K2 that with that, this many of us on the mountain, there was likely to be more deaths that day. The odds were against us. Everybody was thinking, am I next, right? Should I continue going on or should I turn around? And for me, I came to the conclusion very quickly. This is my third expedition to K2. It was my uh, 11th expedition on an 8,000 meter peak. 
And you know what? I felt great that day. I felt like it was my day. You know, like I'd been training for this my whole life, you know, and this was the day that I was, you know, probably one of the strongest I've ever been at altitude. And it was a perfectly clear day. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. It was early in the morning. It was only 5, 4.45 in the morning. I was going to go for it. In fact, I had to go for it because now what had happened was the Koreans were in a state of uh, complete they were just had frozen in place, just like typically happens in these super fearful situations. And they, they needed somebody to go up and to free them from this fear so they could at least descend if that's what they chose to do. And so I climbed up from this pack of people here. So this is the Russians, some of the Italians, Don and Bruce and myself. And I started to go up. Now, when we split up our team, we knew we had to change the whole strategy for the day, right? No longer could we think that the Korean team would go second and then we would go third and the Russians would go fourth. No, that whole plan would, had gone out the window. In fact, we didn't even know if we had enough resources to get everybody to the summit. We needed 3,000 feet of rope. We needed ice screws, pitons, and everything. With some of this in Nima's backpack, when he went shooting off the side, maybe we would never be able to get to the top for the lack of this equipment. So we split our team up. Bruce stayed kind of in the middle. Don went all the way to the end. And they interviewed everybody. Do you have a piece of gear? Do you have a piton? Send it up. And they moved all the gear up towards the front of the line. And I climbed up to the, where the Koreans were, tied my rope into theirs, and then continued to lead the rope through these rocks and got to this point up here. At that point, I would used up the 600 feet of rope I had. I was out of rope. The whole thing was about to grind to halt again. And I got on the radio to Bruce. I said, Bruce, send the Russians. They're the strongest guys up here. They have bottled oxygen. And in particular, we wanted a, a, a Russian named Roman. And Roman is about 6'4", and he probably weighs 220 pounds. He could be in the NFL. And uh, you remember the, the James Bond movie with Jaws with the silver teeth? Russia, Roman had all gold teeth. So in every smile that you look like you're talking to Jaws from James Bond, it's like, send Roman right now with rope. And so here comes Roman chugging up the ropes, and he gets to me, and I tie a piece of rope on the Roman. I'm like, go, Roman, go. And he, he takes the rope, and he leads us up to this point here. And then the, 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 the four Russians and myself, we take the rope around and eventually get to the top. So here's the, going, the second half of going to the summit of K2. Base camp. Uh, base camp copy, over. The slope that they're on right now, you know, the famed 45 or 55 or 65 degree bottleneck traverse slope, is in fact freaking steep. And you can see it from here, and Chris is on it right now. We're at the black base of it, anyways. Unbelievable. Considering how hard we've been working, this is a big mountain. Hey, base camp, can you read me? Over. Yes, yeah, loud and clear, Chris. Okay, we're turning the corner on the traverse. Yeah, we got another three, maybe 350 to go. Here comes Don, the summit of K2. Awesome job, Don. Every, the whole uh, base camp, you hear just applause erupting in every different camp, and we're all so excited for you. Over. It's very, very hard summer in these conditions. We either had a deep, deep snow or bulletproof ice. Oh, that's one of the hardest summits I've ever had. Oh, yeah? And I think I only specialize in hard ones. <laughs> we left that one, so that's uh, 15 and a half hours, the summit. Oh, oh yeah. I think I just pray that we can make it back safely. There's a... Uh, so we had about 25 people that left camp that morning, and uh, 14 summited with us in our little group. Amongst the people on the summit was the Italian expedition leader, a guy named Daniele Nardi. Daniele was a member of a four-person team, and uh, during this push to the summit, they became separated. Uh, in fact, we found out later they had never even communicated with each other all day long, so they had not really been even caring about each other, or so it seemed. But here he is on the summit of K2. Um, this is a Czech climber named Libor Juher, who's in the middle with us. He's actually come up a slightly different variation. His camp four was below our camp four. He intersected with our route and then came up with us. When he got to the summit, he leaned over to Bruce and said, uh, I am Czech, I am Libor, I am very sick. So here we are on the summit of K2 with a man who just told us he's very sick, right? Don looks at me, oops, Don looks at me and says, wrong button, Don looks at me and says, you know what, 
I'm having stomach problems. I've been vomiting all day. It's like, oh my God, you're completely dehydrated. The worst thing you could be at those altitudes is dehydrated because it's going to rush on the onset of cerebral edema. We have a lot of problems on our hand. We now have to get down with two people that are sick. Everybody else who's tagged the summit, the Russians, the Koreans, and everybody else has already tagged the summit and went down, leaving Bruce and I to take down these two people who are not feeling very well. The Italian has gone down. The Portuguese has gone down. So here we are descending off the summit of K2. It, we got to the summit at 445 at, in the afternoon, so it's horribly late. We're descending into the shadow of the mountain, which basically we're, we're descending into darkness. You might have noticed on the way up that it was quite warm. We could just wear a fleece jacket at times. Now we have on down jackets, down pants, down mittens. We're descending into this, and it's freezing cold, uh, maybe minus 20. And as we get about 5.30 at night, we see two people still coming up. And we try to dissuade them to go down, but no, they're so close to the summit. They're going to continue going up. It's the Italian team, and here they are pushing up. This is Stefano Zafka, who at 9.30, this is him at 9.30 in the morning oh, suffering. Daniele. His team thinks he's gone down, but he continues going up. <laughs> this is the Italian base camp just finding out that Daniele Nardi has summited K2. So their expedition is now a success. There's Daniele at the top. They have no idea that two other members of the four-person team are still going up. Mario, Mario, Campo Passe, Basso, Mario, Mario, Campo Passe, Basso. Is there any, been any uh, sights on uh, Mario over? Yes, we've seen Mario, he's behind us, but nothing happened. Uh, Daniele is the only person who doesn't speak to me concerned about him. I've not understood, but... Located. So, Mario, okay, very good, we copy that. 15 minutes, 30 minutes in time. Mario, Mario, Campo Passe, Basso, Mario, Mario, Campo Passe, Basso. Mario, Mario, Mario. He's going to the summit. You are uh, how many how many times? Maybe one hour. Stefano is with him. Stefano and Mario. <laughs> Even if he's close to the top, it's not good. too late. That becomes dangerous. Yes. Really dangerous. Ti sentiamo, dove sei, Passo? Sono il Beta e il Passo. Mario, sei un adorabile Passo. Mario, sei un adorabile Passo. È tardissimo. Sei arrivato adesso, Passo? Sì. C'è Claudio che è scoppiato a piangere, passo. Te lo fai morire questo ragazzo qua, Mario, passo. I see that I want to cry. This, <clears throat> this. Here we are descending from the summit. It's, it's. Uh, <clears throat> we're on the fixed lines now. Remember, there's 3,000 feet of rope that we've put out. Uh, we were descending down. We need to get to this point here where we disconnect from the lines and we can walk back to camp. At uh, eight o'clock at night, Don and I are getting to the ends of the rope. The check climber has gone on ahead of us. It's pitch black, dark. There's so much clouds over the sky. There's not a, s a star in the sky. And Don is walking past an object that he thinks is a plastic garbage bag, and it says to him, help me, I'm dying. And it's the check climber. He's gotten himself down to the end of the ropes where he collapsed. He has no idea where to go. He's suffering from cerebral edema, hypothermia. We lift him up, he walks 50 feet and collapses. We lift him up again, he walks 20 feet and collapses. We're over 1,000 feet from camp. We put him over our shoulders and literally start to drag this man 
for over an hour to try to bring him back to our campsite. We can't get him to his camp for it. It's too far away. We don't even know where his tent is. So we drag him into our tent. We send Bruce out ahead to try to start making water for us. We get into the tent. Uh, we send Don in first. We send uh, Libor in second. We have no sleeping bag for a fourth person, so I give up my sleeping bag so Libor can be warmed up. There's a three-person tent. We're going to try to cram four people into it. It's not really a pleasant thought to climb in there, so I'm standing outside the tent for as long as I possibly can, and I go over to the Italian tent, and I start to ask the Italian leader, Daniele, who's been down for hours, right, resting in his tent, Daniele, have you heard from Mario and Stefano? No, Chris, they won't call me on their radio. And I look up the mountain, and I can see their lights together on the traverse. So they're at least three hours away. So you know what, Daniele? They should be back here at around midnight. If they're not back here by midnight, come and get me, and we will rescue these guys. He says, OK, Chris, great idea. So 11 o'clock or 11.30, Mario calls into the camp. Daniele, I'm lost. Give me directions. Daniele gives him directions. He gets to tent at 1 o'clock in the morning. He climbs into the tent. Remember these eyes in case you ever meet this guy in a dark alley. He says, Daniele, he cl climbs in a tent next to Daniele. Dan Mario, where is Stefano? Oh, he is right behind me. Let's lay down and rest. They lay down, they fall asleep. Three o'clock in the morning. D Mario, Mario, where is Stefano? Oh, I don't know. Go find him. So Mario gets outside the tent to go look for Stefano. Daniele goes back to sleep, right? We are th six feet away. They never come and tell us that Stefano is missing. Then Mario goes out. We don't know if he went out for five minutes or 15 minutes, but he comes back into the tent. This time he's very quiet, so he doesn't have to wake up Daniele. They go back to sleep. Seven o'clock in the morning now. We have ne no sign of Stefano. A blizzard has hit K2. And the thing that happens up at this altitude when these blizzards hit, your, your very chance for survival is extremely limited. In fact, in 1986, at the same Camp 4, seven people made the summit. They came back down to Camp 4. They got trapped in a blizzard that night. They said, you know what, we'll wait a day. Let's rest. Let's regain our strength. Let's wait for the winds to blow the storm out, and then we'll descend tomorrow. That day, the first person died in her sleeping bag. The leader of the team goes around to these two different tents, three different tents, checking in, everybody sees the one woman dead. Her partner is in a coma, right? So they've just, their bodies have given up the fight. He says, we have to go down. Five of them are left. They start to leave camp. They're descending from Camp 4. They go about 100 meters below Camp 4. four. Two people of the five sit down and die, right? They're so completely exhausted, they can't will themselves to move any further. They continue to send somewhere between Camp 3 and Camp 1, one of the three people disappears. Two of seven make it off the mountain alive. This is the stuff that you as a student of K2, as someone who's climbing it, has memorized. Oh my God, we're stuck in Camp 4 in a blizzard after summoning. We will die like the 1986 team. We have to get ourselves out of here. The Portuguese climber is running around, let's go, let's go, let's go. He takes off. He takes off with the Russians. He takes off with the Koreans. Leaves us with Libor. Leaves us with the Italians. Leaves us with the Iranians to help get those guys down. The Italians get completely dressed. They leave their tent. They try to follow in the footsteps of the, the, the Russians. The footsteps have already blown over. They get totally lost. They come back up to the tents. Come on, Chris, let's go, let's go. You need to leave now. Like, we're not ready to leave. We're dealing with Libor. He's you know, having these anxiety attacks, he barely can walk. We need to treat his issue before we can get him off the mountain. Like, no, you have to leave now. It is so dangerous. It's so dangerous, in fact, that Stefano is dead. They tell us this at 8.30 in the morning. Stefano had been left outside by himself all night in this horrible blizzard. He, never, he didn't even have a radio, right? So the Italians had, you know, four guys in the mountain, but they only had two radios. Mario, when he left Stefano, took the radio with him so he could call down and ask for directions and left Stefano up there on his own in a weakened state to try to find his own way down, right? Impossible task. So it's 8.30 in the morning. We find out for the first time that Stefano has not come down. The Italians have already tried to leave Camp 4 but have forced to come back up to us. It's a raging blizzard. We can't even see 10 feet out there. We have Libor. We look at each other and we say, they're right. Stefano is dead. 36-year-old man. His second attempt on K2, he's been left by his partners. There's no chance for him now. When you are caught out in that extreme situation, you actually freeze solid at 40 below in six hours. So let's just pray that Stefano laid down in the snow and he just froze to death. 
his body will always be up there. That's what happens to you when you die up there. Like when you go to the summit of Mount Everest, you step over around seven dead bodies. There were people just like Stefano who had a vision of themselves getting to the summit of Everest. They wanted so desperately to get a picture, and they die generally on the way down. So just like Stefano, those other seven people on Everest, when they find them and they go into their jacket, they're going to find a camera, and that camera is going to be a picture of them on the summit of Mount Everest, a picture that nobody will, you know, now will never see. They were so driven by their vision. So here we are. We're trying to descend in this horrendous blizzard. We have Libor with us. We have the Italians with us. We have the Iranian climber with us. And I almost forgot to tell you this. One of the other teams, not only did they, in a panic state, leave Camp 4 to go back down, but they had lost one of their pairs of crampons. Right? So you need these crampons to snap onto the bottom of your feet to keep them slipping on the ice. So what we do is when we get in our tent, we sit on the front of our tent, we take the crampons off and we leave them in this little room called the vestibule in the front of the tent. So what we do every day, we do the same thing. The first guy gets in, he puts his crampons down, the second guy puts it on top, the third, and then we had Libor, so now we had four pairs of crampons sitting in a pile when we went to bed that night. We wake up in the morning, we only had three pairs of crampons. Somebody else who had lost their crampons had stolen the crampons out of the front of our vestibule. So now we're descending. We're descending without a pair of crampons. Don says, you know what, I'll go down without the crampons. As he's descending, he hits a patch of ice above, just above Camp 3. He slides and tumbles towards Camp 3. By a miracle, he lands right side of the tent. But as he was tumbling, he heard a snapping noise. And when he stands up, his leg collapses. Here's a man at 24,500 feet in a horrible blizzard with a broken leg. What are we going to do now? We have to get him down. We have to get Libor down. We have to get all of ourselves down. We are still you know, two days from safety. We know we can't all make it to Camp 2. Libor can't make it to Camp 2. He's too physically destroyed. I'll stay at Camp 3 with Libor. Don, you go down with the Italians, the Iranian, and Bruce. And you guys can, they'll help you down. They'll get you to Camp 2. In Camp 2, we have a tent waiting for us with stove, fuel, and a backup sleeping bag. So don't carry a sleeping bag, Don. Take the lightest pack you possibly can, right? Because you've got a broken leg, and start to go down. That's the plan when we leave. You know what happens as soon as they leave? The Italians and the Iranian race down to Camp 2. Bruce and Don slowly follow. They get into Camp 2 at 8 o'clock at night. They get to our tent at Camp 2. Don opens the, the door to the tent, and in there is four people. It's a three-person tent with four people. The Iranian and the three Italians are inside our tent. Mario is inside Don's sleeping bag. Don goes, well, first of all, can I get in the tent? No, Don, there's no room for you in this tent. Well, why don't you guys stay in your own tent? Oh, somebody left the door open. It's filled with snow. It's destroyed now. Maybe you could stay in our destroyed tent. Like, this is my tent. And Mario, that's my sleeping bag. And Mario goes to him, you know what? Yesterday, this was your sleeping bag, Don. Tomorrow, this will be your sleeping bag. But today, it is my sleeping bag. And he left Don to sit in the vestibule of the tent for the whole night. They wake up the next morning. Libor and I are coming from three. We get to two. We get to one. We finally catch up with Don and Bruce. As we are getting right to advanced base camp, some check climbers have come around the corner to help us. We get back down to advanced base camp. It's now 5 o'clock at night. It's impossible to carry Don in the, in the remaining hour or so of sunlight back to base camp. So Don and I spend one more night in advanced base camp. We're laying in the tent next to each other. He's in extreme pain. We're calling up Johns Hopkins Hospital. Some doctors know we're trying to figure out what we can do for this guy. We're praying that the weather will break the next day. The weather will bring a helicopter in. But no luck. It's socked in with clouds the next morning. And at 5.30 in the morning, we're just laying in our tent. We hear noise outside the tent. And we open the tent door, and it's 40 people have come from base camp. They left at 4 o'clock in the morning. They've climbed up. They brought pieces of tent poles and rope and stuff, and they built a stretcher for Don, and they carry him back to base camp. It was the most amazing moment. We get back there. There's an orthopedic surgeon. He thinks for certain Don has broken his tib fib. We have to fly Don out. That's the plan. The day we get back to K2 base camp, it's actually my birthday. And uh, I don't know if you guys have been to Pakistan before, but it's a dry country, right? So Libor and I are trapped at Camp 3 in this storm, and Libor looks at me and goes, Chris, do you drink beer? I'm like, yeah, Libor, I like beer. He goes, good, I have brought one beer into Pakistan. Like, shh. <laughs> <laughs> I say, if I get to the summit of K2, I will drink this beer. Now I want you to share this beer with me. I said, Libor, I, I am honored. I said, but we have a big problem on our hands. You have seven members in your team. There's five guys in our team. If we break out one beer between 12 people, we will have a riot on our hands. 
And he's like, oh, I've not thought of this. I said, don't worry, I've smuggled six beers into Pakistan. <laughs> so between, between 12 of us, we each had half a beer apiece and we were completely plastered. So anyway, four days later, we were able to, to bring a helicopter in to fly Don and the rest of the guys out. Um, you know, Bruce said it best. Two people did lose up there. Nima Nurbu Sherpa was trying to make $25 a day and lost his life. His family is, uh, you know, is in Kathmandu. Um, hopefully, there's some kind of insurance fund or something to take care of his two young kids. So Stefano Zafka, who was left up there, not only did he, uh, you know, was abandoned, but his whole family was abandoned by the team. I found out later that Daniele Nardi and Mario Vielmo stopped by the Zafka family in Italy and uh, spent 15 minutes with them. Now, you've just lost your son. You have a million questions. You don't even know where to begin. And they stopped in for 15 minutes and then left their house. When I heard this, I was appalled. So I, I flew to Italy last November, and I met with the Zafka family, and I spent eight hours with them, explaining everything I could, could. At the end of that eight hours, they were willing to admit that their son had made horrible mistakes, right? That he pushed himself beyond his ability or his limits, and you know, he had chosen a horrible team, but they still couldn't come to grips with why did your team you know, perform at such a high level? Why were you guys out there to rescue the check climber? Why were you out there to help everybody get down? Why were you carrying all the rope to help everyone get to the top? Why were you doing all this other stuff? When the Italians were not doing that for anybody, they never climbed like a team. They always separated. They didn't seem to care about you. They didn't even carry radios so they could communicate with each other. And you know, I went to the Italian expedition leader and I asked him those very questions. And he said, you know, Chris, the problem is above 8,000 meters, it's every man for himself. Can you imagine being in an environment where you say, okay, we're going to draw a line in the sand here, and on this side, I have to be altruistic or at least concerned with everybody else, and on this side of the line, I can be purely driven by the most selfish desires of any human being? Well, one thing I've learned in mountaineering, I've been now in 145 expeditions. I've never lost a single person on these expeditions. But in all these trips, I keep coming into the same realization. If you put your personal desires, right, you step over the line ahead of your team's goals, in mountaineering, somebody is going to die. And it's a truth, I think, that's, you know, that it's a universal truth. We find this in all sorts of, of, of aspects of our life. And uh, you know, when we sat down to, to write our book, uh, High Altitude Leadership, Don Schmank and I, who's an amazing uh, business consultant, he's actually the, one of the smartest guys I've ever met, we started to talk, of, it all started with telling these kinds of stories. In fact, it started on an expedition to Ecuador, and I was telling him about all these crazy things that have happened. He's like, oh my god, you see the parallels between how you guys act in the mountains to how groups normally work? And we identify what we thought were eight different dangers, and you guys can read the book to find out all about it. But there's two things that I think are very true and hopefully obvious to you after this talk. One is, it's not just picking a goal. It's not just getting to the summit at K2. For us, it was first and foremost about where are we going to get everybody down from the summit. Then we wanted the summit. And third was, would we do it in a style that we would be proud of for the rest of our lives? And I think we accomplished that bigger goal. And then the second piece is all about partnership. You know, and, and just like on this trip, as I told you earlier, you've got to be really careful how you pick your partners. And it, you should be really most focused on how do they behave. You know, like what's their behavioral pattern, not necessarily where's their technical skills. And I find that those two things are, are universal truths for me that have been able to, you know, I've applied it to the growth of my own business to work super successful. And I would imagine, I think we have two and a half minutes left. If you guys uh, have any questions, I would love to take them and would love to see how this resonates with the Google world. Or if anybody wants to get on the bus and go to K2 right now, we could all take it off. How does your uh, risk-taking behavior in your personal life correspond to the decisions you make in business? Uh, so Brian and I have known each other before. But uh, you know, I, I really consider myself a conservative. Like I live in a three-bedroom rancher, right? You know, I'm a, res, you know, a suburban dad. And I consider myself very conservative, although I do take a, a ton of risks, obviously. So for me, it's just like you. Collect a lot of data and then try to use the data to help drive my decisions. 
But in the end, I always trust my gut. I think that we have a sixth sense. There's something inside of us that's like a subconscious level of data uh, <laughs> manipulation. And then if I can get that sixth sense to kick in, some of it will give me a piece of information that I didn't know earlier. And as I said, I've been on 145 expeditions. I've never lost a single person. And I think it's by really uh, being very uh, detailed and determined about the way that we approach these challenges that make all the difference in the world. Hi, I just wanted to say what probably everybody else in this room is thinking, which is that you are a complete badass. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but more importantly, in the book, uh, Good to Great, yeah. Jim Collins, he studies all these high-performing companies, and he says the biggest question is who you hire into the firm before your tactics, your strategy, or your vision. And he says for those um, high-performing leaders, it's more important to understand their character and their innate qualities rather than like their technical skills and experience. Would you agree with that statement in your experience? Well, I think the only reason I wouldn't agree is because I feel like life is a process of understanding who I am. And if I waited to know who I am when I started my business, started my career, I, I would have never started, right? So it was only through by being, you know, getting the crap kicked out of me that I had these, you know, epiphanies happen along the way. So I kind of think about it as start first with passion, right? Start with uh, this, you know, like you guys, you know, wake up in the middle of the night with this burning desire to do something different, right? And approach a challenge in a new way. And then from that, I try to build my team and then, you know, you know iterate along the way. I, I, I'm not quite sure I have ever had the luxury of doing it the other way around was let's pick a team, let's do this, this, and then figure out what we're, our goal is going to be. So, and so I would flip it a little bit that way. Where are you headed next? Uh, well, I'll be actually. Those Wharton guys have me busy this winter, but uh, in 2009, we're, we're sticking close to home. We'll be you know, like going to Ecuador and to Kilimanjaro and stuff like that. I'm doing more and more work with, uh, with the federal government these days. And uh, we, in 2010, we want to go back to Kachinjunga, which is the third highest peak. And you know, I wish I had had more time. This talk normally is about an hour and 10 minutes, but there's a great sub story here, and it was about filming this whole expedition. So we filmed it for NBC, and uh, we went up there, three chuckleheads with handy cams, and uh, we actually were nominated for an Emmy, and we got to go to the Emmy Awards, and so uh, that spurred a whole other level of creativity within me. We didn't win. We were Emmy finalists, and you know, that's a tough thing to come second place in. You know? So anyway, we're hoping in 2010 we get to film that again. So. So uh, do you have any comment on what happened this August and bottleneck? Yeah, so this year, if you guys don't know, I, oh, th so in 2007, 18 people summited K2. Two people died. Both times was because of human error, right? In 2008, the exact same uh, scenario was unfolding. In fact, I had sent emails back and forth to four of the expedition leaders before they, let, they went. Let them know the tactical or you know like the tactics of running your summit day. You need rope. This is how much rope you need. This is where you need to place the rope, and so on. And had detailed conversations with at least two of the four people I'd been in contact with about this. And uh, so here they were at Camp Four. There was roughly 25, or actually more than that, maybe 40 people were going to go to the top. And uh, they made a couple of decisions that were very different from ours. Remember, our decision was, let's take on the, 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 the most risky segment of summit day and make that our responsibility. Because if, I, if my life is going to be on the line, I want to be the one calling the shots. I don't want to abdicate my personal responsibility or my safety to somebody else. Right? They had the exact opposite perspective. They decided, let's send the Sherpas and the high altitude porters up first to, make all the, to call the shots. Right? So these guys went up there. There were people being paid $25 a day. And uh, some ropes were placed in the wrong place. In fact, we told them to bring a minimum of 2,500 feet of rope. It seemed like they only brought 1,500 feet of rope. So they were kind of working against uh, themselves there. And then uh, they, they fixed the ropes through there. Anyway, they had a lot of problems with the rope fixing. Um, first guy dies by disconnecting from the rope and trying to, to wrestle with his backpack. He falls to his death just like Nima did in 2007. The second guy dies by trying to go to his body and to try to carry a dead body off the side of the mountain, which I think is just a horrible thing. The number one rule in rescue is don't kill the rescuer. So here we were. Uh, they decided to rescue a dead body and kill somebody in the process, which I think, is, as I said, is a horror. Uh, then uh, they continued going to the summit. And on the way back down, 
Uh, one of them, a guy named Ralph Bai, who is a good friend of mine, an amazing mountaineer, he gets wiped away in an avalanche, and when he pu is pulled off the mountain by the avalanche, he's connected to some rope. The anchors pull off the mountain, and he pulls a key section of rope out with him, right? His wife is, sees him fall to his death. She and her partner have a, a, a climbing rope in their pack, and they take it out, and they anchor it in, and now they're able to rappel down off the steep section and they are starting to traverse across. We don't know all the details, but it appears as if at least one other person coming down that rope afterwards uh, thought it was connected to something, and it wasn't. So it was just dangling in free air and rappelled right off the end of the rope. That was a guy named Hughes, who's a Frenchman who I was with as well in 2007. So, uh, and then just all hell continues to break loose. In the end, 11 people die. It seems as if only one of them was an act of God that killed them. It seems as if the others were where at least their deaths were compounded by a series of human errors. It was a horrible thing for me. In fact, it was, it was, it was a very devastating week for me to, to go through that whole thing. I couldn't believe it unfolded in the way that it did. So, But I think in some ways, if you go back and analyze it, there's, some of it was predictable. So, In fact, it was so predictable that one of the guys who was sending me emails back and forth kept saying, well, this sounds like the most dangerous part. I said to him, the last email I sent says, no, you won't be killed there. The place that'll kill you is ice coming off the, the uh, traverse, and that's exactly what killed this guy. So, Isn't these talks the worst marketing tool in the world? <laughs> so. All right, well, go to work. Have fun. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>